Tonight, Queensland Premier Giggles Miles told to resign after gigging through a question about a murdered 70-year-old woman. Also tonight, Prince Harry flees Britain after getting even less time with his father than we reported, and none at all with his brother. And a comparison, Anthony Albanese versus Peter Dutton. How one stood up this week to China and the Greens, anti-Semitism, and the other ran a mile. You'll find that comparison fascinating. And so much more tonight. General Jack Keane on Israel saying no to Hamas peace offer. Joe Biden goes, uh, whoa, uh, Hamas? And Barnaby Joyce will be along as well, plus a challenge to the Greens from the Israeli ambassador. And my book of the week for the young conservative in your life and a whiskey that deserves a break after the shenanigans of the distillery's former CEO. But let me get on with it. Uh, today, I heard something brilliant. From about the last person I expected, actually, I was stunned and moved. And I'd like everyone to see this and stand tall. And that's because you're probably as sick as I am of all this trashing we're seeing of this country, like the tearing down of our statues, like the Prime Minister flying now three flags. That's the sign of a divided nation. Or the government-funded attacks on our Western heritage or the demands that we destroy this supposedly evil colonisation and... Oh, and the cringing self-hatred of politicians apologising for sins more often imagined than real. Governments of all persuasions have failed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And for example, the rubbishing this week by both sides of politics, actually, for, of a genuine Australian hero. I talked about that earlier this week, how the Prime Minister and Indigenous Australians Minister both accused Matron Ruby May Hyde a Christian missionary, long dead now, of supposedly being mean to an Aboriginal girl in her charge and even implicating her in supposed child stealing, the stolen generations. In fact, these lazy, comfortable, complacent, know-nothing critics were wrong. I cited evidence and eyewitnesses who said Sister Hyde gave her life and her love to save the abandoned Aboriginal children being dumped on her, helping children like the late Lowitcher O'Donoghue when no one else would out of Christian charity. But as I said on this show, after we last year voted against, thank God, Labour's voice, I am going to concentrate this year on finding those things that unite us and inspire us, build pride again, that prove this country is nothing like what our elite stupidly insists, you know, it's racist, it's cruel, it's a rancid construct of evil colonialism. And today, what a wonderful surprise a tribute to Australia. In fact, a tribute to colonialism, would you believe? And missionaries, like Sister Hyde. Missionaries as well. From Papua New Guinea's Prime Minister James Marape giving a speech today in our parliament and actually reminding us of the values and the great Australian character I think we're losing. Now listen to this. It <laughs> won't hear it from our Prime Minister praising what Australia gave to PNG when we were its colonial masters. It turns out that colonialism can actually be a powerful good to a country suffering from lawlessness, a country that's dirt poor and tribal. Does that ring any bells? But the greatest and most profound Australian rule impact of the Australian administration is the democracy you left with us. Our constitution, our democratic system of government, our judiciary, the public service, the education system, our financial and banking system, and our Christian worldview is what you left in PNG. You see me standing here speaking in English. I learned that through the school system you set up. The God I worship today, the Christian God, is the God your missionaries brought into Papua New Guinea. The imprint, imprint of Australia is second to none in Papua New Guinea. Your legacies live on. Now, of course, the political news in this speech was that Marape gave a very big hint that we should stop worrying about reports that he's talking about making deals with China, which could actually spell real trouble for us. He made clear that in the end, this shared culture that we have with his country, thanks to colonialism, makes us family and China isn't. In a world of many relations with many nations, nothing will come in between our two countries. 
because we are family. Through tears, blood, pain, and sacrifice that are now anchored in our eternal past, our nations are constructed today. But me, I was struck and, like I say, moved by the praise that he gave to Australia and our colonial past, the sort of praise that Labour and the Greens never would. They'd choke to praise colonialism in Papua New Guinea or in Australia. Since colonialists also gave Aborigines the same things that Marapu was talking about, democracy, law and order, rule of law, development, Christianity, and that passport that is the English language. I mean, National Senator Jacinta Nampachimpa Price has talked brilliantly about this. Oh, the controversy. But Labor won't. But the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea did something else. He reminded us of the kind of Australians who delivered all those gifts to Papua New Guinea, people that actually had the same kind of character as Matron Hyde. He praised the special constables that we sent to PNG who acted as a kind of cross between police and peacemakers and magistrates and even social workers at times. These are officers popularly called KIAPs. This special breed of men patrol my country well into its interior in the 1950s and 60s after the war, many of them losing their lives from the challenges of that occupation. It is the role, it is on this note, I want to acknowledge a couple of special surviving KIAPs who are still here with us three of them in this precinct, in the public galleries. Graham Watts, who served in Rabaul, Bill Sanders, who served in Chimbu, John and Morag Hocknell, who are present in, the, and, uh, present in the public gallery. I just want to appreciate them. They represent a fair dinkum spirit of Aussies. Absolutely. And Marape singled out this couple who had their first child out in the jungles of PNG, far from modern health facilities. That is duty. In fact, I read a brilliant summary about the kind of men that we did send over to PNG and I hope still have somewhere here in this country, although I almost never hear them celebrated. It was from Chris Overland, who was a key up himself in the 1970s. And he said it was a culture with the key apps that valued intelligence, a sense of adventure, physical and psychological resilience, none of this victim stuff, stoicism and courage, or at least no tendency to panic in the face of adversity, and a strong orientation towards doing whatever it took to get a job done. None of this, oh, you can't ring me after five o'clock, boss. These are men and women of our heroic past. These are people who brought the gifts of Western culture to Papua New Guinea, just like earlier generations gave it to Australia. Now, the leader of Papua New Guinea today in our own parliament praised them. And I think we should now expect and even demand that our own politicians learn to praise them too. I tell you what, Australia's defences seem to be a bit of a shambles, don't they? I mean, we don't have a single drone, for instance, the new weapon of the modern battlefield. Uh, we have too few missiles. We don't have enough sailors to even man our ships and on and on and on. So it was no surprise to me to read that there's been a blow up between Defence Minister Richard Miles and his military and department chiefs. As the Financial Review put it today, he doesn't respect them and they sure as hell don't respect him. This talk of yelling and finger pointing, but today Miles was not backing down. Why does the minister blame officials for his own failures of leadership? I make no excuses or apologies for demanding excellence and a culture of excellence. Now, this is a rare brawl where I'm on no one's side. Defence bosses are reportedly angry because Miles is sitting on piles of requests and reports, not making decisions and not giving them the extra money that they need. Miles is reportedly angry because his defence officials are asking for all sorts of stuff that the recent defence review said weren't urgent or particularly useful for us, like new armoured vehicles and tanks, when we actually need badly swarming drones and missiles and things like that. Joining me is Barnaby Joyce, the Nationals front bencher, former Deputy Prime Minister. Barnaby, a brawl like this, how often have we heard now, oh, for years, I think, 
of defence officials at war with their minister. <laughs> Meanwhile, maybe it's a connection here. We're not getting the weapons we actually need. Oh, it's a fiasco, isn't it, Andrew? <clears throat> I mean, the most recent one for the Australian people to clearly understand is we couldn't get a ship to, uh, the, to, to protect the Suez Canal, one of our vital trading components. Now, they say they didn't want to. It suddenly looked more like they weren't capable of it. We can't get crews for the vessels. Um, we've had... That, there was an excellent article the other day by Dupont, and as you pointed out, you're looking at what's happening in the Ukraine, how the new battlefield is working, and we need drones. They're just in hiatus as they sort of sit around and wait and, you know, have review after review, then just stagnation. Uh, this is a, a really critical thing for Australia. It's, it's really where... The debate, rather than concentrating on shows on the ABC in Question Time, they should be concentrating on defence and how you defend our nation, which right now has some some serious Spot issues on. that we we need to ca we, that we need to pick up on. Barnaby, absolutely right. Meanwhile, I mean, I was just talking about the key up culture in uh, Papua New Guinea. Can do sense of duty, really, you know, go and in and fix it. <laughs> Meanwhile, the reforms today, uh, the industrial relations reforms. The Greens snuck in a provision that to allow employers to be jailed for 12 months if they ignore instructions not to ring workers after hours. Listen, Barnaby, I can't think of a single good thing that this government has ever done for, for employers, but a whole list of goodies it's given to its union backers and slackers. Well, not only does it show they've got you know, incompetence out there, They've actually got incompetence in there. They don't read the own amendment that they've put through. Now, it wouldn't come in for another six months. And now they're desperately, you know, so thank God for that, but now they're desperately saying, oh, gosh, we all just voted for something that could have put someone in jail for making a phone call. I mean, this is... It, you, you just wouldn't read about this. And we're still sitting back waiting. They said on the 22nd of December that have amalgamated the acts of Durka, Merka and VEA acts in Veterans Affairs, 22nd of December. What's today? It's we're getting towards the middle of February. Sight nor sound of it. It's just incompetence. And, you know, when you see that, you're, you're seeing when you have incompetence at that level in the chamber, then God help you down in the department and on in the field. But, Barnaby, uh, I was, uh, you know, I was so... Pleased and really, like I say, I'll say it again, I was moved to see the uh, Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea enumerate the virtues of Australia in a way I've never heard Anthony Albanese speak of them, and he's our mm. Prime Minister. But speaking of values, it, it, it's wider than that. There's an interesting difference developing between Anthony Albanese and Peter Dutton, the opposition leader, when it comes to defining and defending our values. I want to show you the difference here uh, between their responses to China passing a death sentence, possibly to be commuted, a death sentence on Australian democracy activist Yang Heng Jun. Albanese this week saying, oh, look, it's just bad, no criticism of China. Dutton actually explaining why it was bad and what it said about China. Have a look. We have conveyed, firstly, uh, to... China, our dismay, our despair, our frustration, but to put it really simply, our outrage at this verdict. We need to call out egregious behaviour and it's not just Dr Yang, there are many other freedom fighters and people who are speaking up for civil rights and for human rights who will never see the light of day again. And it's time for our country and for other countries of similar values around the world to be very frank about the human rights abuses that are taking place. So even then, Barnaby, uh, the Prime Minister does not go hard against the nature of China's decision-making and its society, just that he didn't like the decision. What do you make of that? It sounds like he ran his lines sort of past the embassy of China, doesn't it? Heard of that before. And... Uh... It's it's it just goes to show that the foot on our throat is starting to happen when you can't clearly say what needs to be said, and Mr Albanese, as Prime Minister of Australia, should be absolutely clear that there is no foot on our throat, and we will be will be unashamed and straight down the barrel and truthful 
about uh, what is quite obvious. You know, we're having this man is going, he's got a, a basically a suspended death sentence, hasn't killed anybody. He just basically wasn't liked by the government. And this is a reason why our nation needs to become as strong as possible as quickly as possible and stop frolicking in so many issues that are really not the issues that are going to keep your children safe. I tell you what, a country that won't define the difference in values between us, uh, you know, in this case, and a tyranny isn't actually reminding the people back home what the difference really is and why it's important. This is the issue here. But Barnaby, we missed you on Tuesday because you helped organise that rally against renewables at Parliament House. You had to duck into mm -hmm. Parliament. You were going to come on the show, but you had to duck into Parliament for a vote or something. Uh, what did you make of the turnout and uh, the message there? Well, it's growing. It's growing all the time. And it is the, one of the great swindles. It's the great Wild West swindles of wind factories and solar factories. These secret deals, secret deemed rates of returns that these, you know, the Ch Beijing Energy Corporation gets where basically they can get 17, 18% on their you know, $100 million investment, pay interest around about 4%, pocket $14, you know, $14 million a year, using an, as an example a possible $100 million investment. Uh, it, they, they don't have to abide by vegetation management laws. They, don't, they can kill fauna and flora at their whim. Uh, they get absolutely just breeze through. Your reliability of your power goes through the floor, your price goes through the roof and the money goes overseas. And people are waking up to it. They, they're starting to call it for what it is. And I even had the, the, which was interesting, a guy who would vote for me in a pink fit, a person who stood for the Green Street Times, or the Australian Conservation Foundation, people on the, even on the other side of the fence are saying, this is a scam. This is an absolute scam. And the fourth estate, and I know you do, Andrew, but, but they've got to start asking some serious questions about exactly what, what the hell is going on out there. What is the gain for all this pain? I, I, I wanted to pass on to you on Tuesday. Interesting ally you now have. It's not just Bob Brown, the former Greens leader. Jeff Mosley used to head the Australian Conservation Foundation before it went mad. Um, Australian Conservation Foundation former boss also uh, was supported that rally, actually. Supported that rally. Doesn't like what's being done to the countryside in the name of, uh, you know, saving the planet. Barnaby Joyce, lovely to talk to you. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much. But now let's uh, keep being positive this, because there's been a rare bit of good news about uh, our councils. Last night, Melbourne's Port Phillip Council voted against a Labor councillor's objections and decided, well, hell yes, we are going to repair the Captain Cook statue that was cut down in the night before Australia Day. We're going to put it straight back up. We talked about this earlier this uh, week. They decided, quite rightly, that vandals must not be allowed to win. They must not be allowed to decide what heroes we choose collectively to honour simply by going and cutting statues down. And James Cook, by the way, is a hero. And like I say, I was surprised, and maybe that's because I'm too cynical, or is it because so many of us have actually lost faith in our councils? Well, someone's actually polled Australians on exactly that question. Joining me is Dean Hurlston, President of Council Watch, which, which runs a ruler over councils that go crazy. Uh, Dean Hurlston, thank you so much for your time. Your poll, what did it tell you? Well, thanks, Andrew. It actually told us that people were actually more interested in their council focusing, funnily enough, on roads, uh, footpaths, parks, open space, cleanliness, street cleaning, and all those basics that we expect, like maternal health, childcare, aged care, etc. Not the things that councils say we want. Now, no, of course, that is what we want. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy that we need to <laughs> poll people to actually have that suspicion confirmed. But the point is here, what do they actually see their councils doing and do they trust them? 
No, absolutely not. We actually found that over 80% of respondents across the state said that the service from their council and the delivery was poor or very poor. Uh, around 75% said that rates were much harder or very hard to actually pay this year. Uh, and what we know in a cost of living crisis is every dollar counts. And we know that our councils are not delivering what residents say. What we do know, Andrew, is that those very things that councils love to splash, splash across their lovely glossy magazines and social media, uh, Indigenous reconciliation, LGBTQ rights uh, and climate change are actually the bottom priorities that no one really wants to hear about. <laughs> Is that right? Is that right? Oh, that's incredible. Is that correct? Well, but then look, Again, you know, that is what I would hope in a sane society. I was losing faith, right? I was thinking, am I on my own? So I read uh, these results with pleasure, may I say, Dean, relief even. But the, the question then is, if it's obvious and true that people want roads and rubbish collection, that's what they want, and if it's also true, can the politics guys explain to me why the councils do tend to go and grand political gestures like uh, flying the Palestinian flag, support Palestine, um, promote the voice, let's hold rallies for the voice, a number there, I think in Geelong as well, banning Australia Day citizenship ceremonies, uh, doing the whole fandango about global warming, even go to conferences overseas about it. How does that happen? So the problem is we have councillors and CEOs who are more interested in getting likes attention and, you know, doing things that they think will further their career either politically or in the uh, councils themselves. Yet they are not the things that people want. People want local issues and good quality service delivery. It's not that hard. Uh, people want them to stay off social media, fix the potholes and stop grandstanding on global geopolitical things that councils themselves have no place in. Even the local government minister recently wrote to Dandenong Council and said that the Gaza conflict is nothing to do with local government. <laughs> Yet here we have all of these councils still running around f trying to outdo each other and be the first to hoist a Palestinian flag. It's not that we don't care, Andrew. It's that it's not really local government's problem. Stay in your lane and don't abuse your Absolutely. power. I think they're the messages there, Dean. And I think you put your finger on it, particularly for the Labor and the Greens. The councils are the recruiting grounds for future politicians. So they're just... Uh, doing their politics as a, hey, look at me, rather than, hey, I'm serving the community. Dean Helston, terrific research. Thank you so much for your time. After the break, Israel says no... This is going to upset Dan and on council. Israel says no to a peace offer from the Hamas terrorist group to end this war. I'll ask one of America's top generals if this is a mistake, but I'll also show you President Joe Biden. This is scary. He can't even remember exactly who Israel is fighting. This is getting him back. Israel has been at war now for four months against the Hamas terrorist group that controls Gaza and which started this war by massacring 1,200 Jews on October 7, plus kidnapping about 250. Now, with Israel controlling much of Gaza in this war, having killed or wounded maybe 20,000 Hamas terrorists, Hamas has offered a peace deal. Well, it's actually more of a victory deal for Hamas. Stage one of this three-stage deal, uh, and it will last the first stage, 45 days, would have Hamas release just some of its Jewish hostages, just the, the women it hasn't yet killed, younger teenagers, uh, the very old, sick. Israel, in exchange, is supposed to stop shooting, let everyone go back to their homes in Gaza, uh, release a couple of thousand Palestinian prisoners, including about five, 600 uh, serving life sentences or very long sentences for things like murder, terrorism, and open the crossings to Gaza, step up aid, help give... A, I mean, the full thing. And not surprisingly, Israel's Prime Minister isn't buying it. I came here this evening to say we are on our way to that decisive victory. It is in our hands. It's not a matter of uh, perhaps weeks. 
but it is in a matter of months. The IDF are working systematically and they will achieve all the objectives of the war. They're going to release all the hostages, eliminate Hamas, and Gaza will no longer be a threat to Israel. I have decided that that is our objective. That is the decision I made at the beginning of this war, and we will not suffice with less. Yeah, here's the frightening thing. President Joe Biden, right, Israel's supposed ally, sort of, uh, talk about Dottery. Uh, he called the Hamas deal um, over the top, although, to be fair, <laughs> to scare you, he wasn't exactly sure who he was talking about. And I don't want to, I don't want to, I'll maybe choose my words. There's some movement, there's been a response from the, uh, the, the, there's been a response from the opposition, but um, it, it, yes, I'm sorry, from Hamas, but it seems to be uh, a little over the top. Joining me is General Jack Keane. He's a retired four-star general who served as the Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Army. He's now Chairman of the Institute for the Study of War. General Jack Keane, always great to talk to you. Look, Benjamin Netanyahu has rejected this Hamas so-called peace deal and says it's actually after total victory. Is that the right call? Yeah, very much so. Uh, I mean, the proposal at the end of it what the Hamas really wants is that for them to leave Gaza completely. And that's an unacceptable deal. Uh, certainly, uh, between what was proposed and the rejection, I suspect there is a deal to be made, but not on those conditions, uh, Andrew. Um, and I said that. The reason why Hamas has the hostages, at the end of the day, they will keep a certain amount of hostages to protect their leaders and to ask the IDF to withdraw from their territory, or they will not get those hostages back. It's not surprising they went for all of it at this time. But Netanyahu, that's impossible for him to accept a deal like that. Meanwhile, in the U.S., your Congress has just voted against a bill that President Joe Biden wants that toughens controls over the Mexican border with two and a half million illegal immigrants have crossed in just one year. But that bill also, for some strange reason, reason includes money for Ukraine's war against the Russian invaders. I don't think it's, think it's strange to want to fund Ukraine, but why they have to be in the same bill seems to me crazy. So rejecting this seems to me to leave America weaker and Ukraine weaker as well. Why is there this stalemate? Well, our border, as you described it, is hemorrhaging. As a matter of fact, since 1 October, they've had a million people crossed. Nothing like that in the history of the United States. No country can sustain something like that and still declare themselves a sovereign state. That is the problem that we have. But they could not agree on the, on the border pieces of the bill. Uh, Republicans obviously wanted it to be stronger. Democrats thought they made a lot of concessions, but it did not pass for that reason. It had nothing to do with the funding uh, of Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel. What will happen now is they're going to propose a funding of Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan only and keep the border issue out of it, but permit amendments to be made. So that'll likely take place next week, and we'll see what the outcome of that is. Certainly, many of us who spend our days in national security and foreign policy want the funding of Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. But at least, meanwhile, the European Union has finally agreed to guarantee Ukraine more than $80 billion Australian over four years to defend itself from Russia. Is that really going to be enough? Well, it's not going to be enough, but I'll tell you what, it, it is, I applaud what has happened here. 
And the, the Europeans have truly stepped up. There's no doubt about it. It's the United States. While the United States obviously has provided the most money, as, as you and I have talked about for well over a year, they have provided their advanced weapons uh, on an intermittent schedule. It's the Europeans that forced the Americans to put tanks in. It's the Europeans that forced the Americans to put long-range missiles in, like ATACMs and cruise missiles. And it's the Europeans that forced the Americans to commit to F-16s for the Ukrainians. So I, I take my hat off to them, and I've, I've spent a lot of time educating the Americans that the Europeans have truly stepped up here, and the United States has to continue to make this commitment. Look it. If we don't fund Ukraine and we lose Ukraine, Russia wins, China wins, and we've just blown up Europe because Russia will not stop there. That's the reality of it. The Europeans know it. Most of us in the United States certainly recognize that. The majority of the American people for two years support funding of Ukraine. But, General, you know, uh, when I... Uh, I'm, I'm totally on board with your arguments. I just think particularly in our part of the world, you know, China is watching. It's seeing whether the West has got the resolve. There's theories in Russia and China that uh, the West is weak and has not got any staying power. And last, if they can outlast them, uh, they'll fall away. And then China's got the, its eyes on Taiwan. I've got all that. There are people saying, oh, no, you, you, this is foolish that we're getting sucked into a war to defend a corrupt country like Ukraine. It's not our war. Ukraine was... Uh, aggressive and wanting to leave the Russian orbit and to go into NATO. What do you say to them? Well, Ukraine's been an independent country since 1991. They've elected their leaders. They've got a right, the people of Ukraine, just like the people of Australia and America, you know, to determine their own fate. And we respect that right. And they were moving closer to being a part of the European Union and closer to being a part of NATO. And certainly that is what aggravated uh, Putin. He wants to maintain control of that country. But he also wants back the, the European countries that are now a part of NATO that used to be a part of the Soviet Union. And he, and he talks about it all the time. He's dead serious about it. So much so that the, the Germans got some uh, classified information at leaked that indicated how strong their plans are to do just that. I mean, it's not just speculation. There are plans for the Russians to do that. So we have got to take this serious. We're talking about the future of Europe here. And can you imagine if Russia is able to take over Ukraine and then move on Europe, the incentive that's going to provide for President Xi in the Indo-Pacific region is extraordinary. You've got to see the relationship, China, Russia, and Iran. They are all working together. They resent the democratically-led order that exists in the world and the United States as a superpower that helps to lead some of that. They want to turn that around. That's what they have in common. And we've got to see those relationships. In fact, we talk about it at briefings in the Pentagon that the, the idea that we could face more than one country at a time in a war is very real now, something we haven't really thought about since World War II. General Jack Keane, always a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, great talking, Andrew. Thank you. After the break, you remember what we said, the ABC boss said, oh, well, I can't see any bias. Caught out. You checked the difference between the ABC interviewing the Liberal leader all aggro and interruptions. And the ABC interviewing the Labour leader. All sweet and uninterrupted. You won't believe this. The Queensland Premier. Can he last? Stephen Giggles Miles has been after massive criticism for giggling when Sky News Queensland Bureau Chief uh, Adam Walters tried to ask him a question about the stabbing death of Queensland grandmother Violene White in front of a six-year-old granddaughter. Premier Adam Walters from Sky News, the people of Ipswich and North Lakes in Brisbane's north would have noted that there wasn't a single reference to youth crime in your speech. Uh, given... It was a speech about housing. 
It was, but uh, but given that the events of the weekend were so fresh, perhaps there might have been an expectation. I figured I'd get a question. Nonetheless, uh, the absence of any reference to youth crime in your speech to the Queensland Media Club would have been noted uh, by more than a few, including the people of those communities. Premier, I'm sure you concede. Federal Opposition Leader Peter Dutton today joined in the criticism. He reckons Miles is finished. To the issue of law and order and crime, people living in fear, having their bedrooms broken into to steal car keys, uh, people being assaulted, stabbed, murdered, uh, it is, I think, one of the most emotional and serious issues in Queensland at the moment. And if the Premier, in the first instance, doesn't have the ability to conduct himself with decency and dignity and respect, uh, then he's not fit for the job. Secondly, which I think has compounded his problem and now made his position untenable, is that he's concocted this story that actually he wasn't laughing at that. Uh, he must have been thinking of something else. Yeah. Uh, and that it, it wasn't that he was laughing at uh, the issue. Uh, he just happened to be, I don't know, daydreaming or something. But it doesn't, it doesn't stack up. It's a lie. Joining me is the panel, James McPherson and Liz Sora, both of the late debate here on Sky News at 10 p.m. Great viewing. Liz, do you think Stephen Miles can survive this? Well, he does have the nickname Giggles Miles Andrew, and this is sadly the most (laughs) tragic circumstance in which he has displayed that. I mean, this guy is basically the Kamala Harris of Australia. Nothing's funnier to Miles than a question he doesn't know the answer to. He just laughs, even mid-sentence. But this is an issue that has ravaged Queensland for years on end. If the Premier of that state isn't able to give an answer to it, even if you shook him awake at 3am, he's simply not up to the job. Now, it would be a very big feat indeed. The LNP would have to win 13 extra seats as well as sandbagging all the ones that they currently have in order to see the end of Miles at the October election. But Crucifoli has to be one of the only opposition leaders on the state Uh, state governments in Australia that people actually know the name of. This guy's sharp. He's already committed to, should they win government, rewriting the Youth Justice Act, making sure that detention is no longer the last resort for these juvenile delinquents that are just running rampant in the state. And he's promised to restore the rights of victims to being superior to those of the rights of the perpetrators. So this is an issue he has been across. He's very hard line on it. And I think it's something that Queenslanders are desperate to see at a time like this. Uh, You're right about Chris Afouli, I think. Uh, James, what do you make of it? (laughs) Well, Andrew, you remember the uh, handshake that lost the federal election in 2004 when Mark (laughs) Latham almost shook John Howard's arm off his body. Well, in the future, we'll talk about the giggle that lost the Queensland election for Stephen Miles. This confirms every fear of Queenslanders that the Labor government is out of touch and don't take seriously the problems the state has. Anastasia Palaget was better known for being seen with celebrities, walking the red carpet, signing uh, contracts for Olympic Games, than for dealing with the housing crisis, the health crisis and the crime wave. And so here's Stephen Miles giggling and laughing when a reporter asks him about a crime wave, the latest victim of which is a grandmother stabbed to death in broad daylight. So, yeah, this is the end of Stephen Miles because it's everything that Queenslanders hate about this Labor government. Well, absolutely correct. Now, listen, I want to play a contrast. I'll first play the Albanese interview a few weeks ago or at some time, I don't know exactly when it was, that the ABC's Sarah Ferguson did with uh, Anthony Albanese. Look, it's all sweetness and light and all that. Have a listen. Now, the opposition is going to vote your tax cuts through. Does that tell you that you got the politics right on this issue? What that tells me is that they're not fair income. But let's be clear about this. There had to be political considerations before you would make such a bold move, especially for your prime ministership. You accept that, don't you? And for contrast, here is the same interviewer, same show, with the Liberal leader, Peter Dutton, last night. 
do you give credit, actually, to the government for taking a big political risk in breaking a promise in order to help those families? Well, Sarah, I, I don't think it's your job to push the, the position of the government. It's absolutely not. This is, a, this, is, uh, this is an outside observer saying, yeah, I wish is was. this political courage? Well, I'm, I'm going to reject that absolutely. Yeah. This is a question about whether you, as a political observer, acknowledge there is some courage involved, I'm, asking you to reflect I'm on whether it shows political courage. I'm answering your question courage. of whether I think that... Mm. Uh, Liz, what did you make of the contrast? Oh, bias at the ABC, Andrew. Say it ain't so. I mean, we'd be surprised if it was any different, wouldn't we? But what a palaver calling this a bold move. We all know the Labor government would have pulled this to the back teeth before they did it. They were assured it would be a popular move. That's why they did it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have. So now to try and make this as if they've done something oh so brave is jolly well laughable. <laughs> <laughs> James, it's quite extraordinary. I could go on and on. I, I cut those gla grabs short. It's not a misrepresentation. That really is how it was. And, and kudos, I think, to uh, Peter Dutton for calling out Sarah Ferguson to her face. Yes. Absolutely. Well, I watched both interviews and the difference was stark. I mean, Anthony Albanese has just broken a promise he made more than 100 times and Sarah Ferguson says to him, so you've got your mojo back. A bold move. Then she says to Peter Dutton, who hasn't broken any promises, gee, a tough week. Must have been humiliating. But credit goes to Peter Dutton because he did push back on her and he repeatedly pointed out her bias. And that's the way that conservative politicians need to handle the ABC. So I thought Peter Dutton, he kept his cool. He was calm. He was confident. He didn't waffle. And he was getting the raw end of the stick. So I think he came out of it relatively well. Liz Soren, James McPherson, thank you both for your time. Uh, good luck with tonight's show. Not that you need it. It's always great. Thank you very much. I have to say um, on Israel, the Israeli ambassador has set a real challenge now. He's had enough of the Greens here. Enough of the Greens. I love what he's uh, just uh, put out. He said, given the amount of time the Greens are devoted to attacking Israel in Parliament this week, I call on Adam Bant, Maureen Faruqi, Jordan Steele-John and every Greens MP and Senator to set aside 42 minutes uh, in, their, uh, in their schedules next week in Canberra to watch the raw footage proudly recorded by Hamas terrorists on 7 October when they put their genocidal anti-Semitic ideology into action, attempting to ethically cleanse Israel of Jews, massacring and uh, kidnapping Israeli women and children and committing unspeakable crimes against humanity. I found the vision absolutely horrific to watch. I wonder if the Greens have the guts and the integrity to watch even one second of it. Good on that ambassador. After the break, Prince Harry has left London already, confirming the risk with his family is probably permanent. And Danger, a new Muslim group, plans to get seven million, oh, sorry, four million Muslims in Britain to change the country's politics. Plus my whiskey of the week from a distillery that's gone through the wars. Now, I said last night Prince Harry spent an awfully short time in London with his father after flying all the way from America after hearing his father had cancer. Just 45 minutes, I said. But now he's already left to go back home. And it seems the time he spent with his father was even shorter, which really suggests a big riff for a man who could get a lot closer to the succession with his cancer story. Joining me from London is Patrick Christie, star presenter of GB News. Patrick, great to see you. Was it a 45 minute? Because I've heard of estimates of as little as uh, 12 minutes. That can't be right. Well, this is the allegation going around now. It started out at 45 minutes, then it turned to half an hour. And then on my show last night, a Royal Insider revealed that their sources told them that Prince Harry spent as little as 12 minutes with his father. But they also told me that Prince wow. Harry did not actually really inform the royal family that he was coming back until he was basically on a plane. So they weren't expecting him. I know the argument would be, well, look, I'm sure if you or I find out that a loved one has got cancer, you would just move hell and high water to get there. And to be fair, in that sense, I think Harry has done the right thing. But uh, King Charles decided to delay his helicopter to Sandringham, where he is now recuperating, 
buy an additional half an hour to accommodate Harry. The other very telling thing, Andrew, is that Harry spent the night in a London hotel. So the Royals made absolutely no attempt to accommodate him at any of their residences whatsoever. There is Frogmore Cottage, which he and Meghan decided it wasn't quite good enough for them initially, but he didn't spend the night there. So clearly there was no kind of allowances for him. And William decided that he didn't want to see him either. William last night attended a gala dinner looking resplendent in his uh, tuxedo alongside Tom Cruise uh, and did give crowds a little uh, nod saying, look, everything's going OK uh, at the moment. But there's obviously a rift there that I think is irreparable and a big concern that had Harry just come back and touched down and met the king, all that would have happened is we'd have seen it on a Netflix documentary in about six months time. I think you're right. It is irreparable. I do think that. Uh, Patrick, a disturbing development. There's now a new Muslim organisation called the Muslim Vote that says on its website it wants to use the four million Muslims in Britain to push their agenda. You've been covering this. Who are they and how dangerous is this development? So this all started with the attempt just after the October 7th attacks, by the way, to register a party of Islam in the UK. The Electoral Commission decided to knock that back and reject it. So what has happened now is that this new grassroots organisation called The Muslim Vote has just emerged. They say that they've got substantial funding. They've got a lot of corporations behind them, including a group called Prevent Watch that specialises basically in getting people off our de-radicalisation and counter-terrorism scheme, which I think should be a concern to everybody. The Muslim Council of Britain, the Muslim Council of Wales and the Muslim Council of Scotland, they're all backing this group. They've got big legal support. And what they're doing is they're targeting any seat with a high proportion of the Muslim population where that MP voted against a ceasefire in Gaza. The concern here, obviously, is that they're not just all about Gaza. What they've said is that they want to promote quotes unquote Muslim issues. Now, we've gone to them and asked them exactly what does that mean. The concern would be that we're one step closer to Sharia law in the UK. Do expect, I do expect, that there will be several independent Muslim candidates returned at the next election. And when you look at the demographics in Britain, Andrew, how long is it? How long is it really before we have a huge number of independent Muslim MPs in the Houses of Parliament focused singularly on what's going on in the Middle East and, dare I say it as well, those quotes and quotes Muslim issues? We might find out what they are when they come into power. I think it's really troubling because, uh, you know, bringing religion into it so directly like that, it divides a reaction, so that's also an issue. But uh, seriously, they... I can't understand it, Patrick. So many of these people or their parents came to Britain because of what it was, allegedly. Maybe they just wanted the handouts and now want to change what it was that brought them or their families there in the first place. How does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it absolutely doesn't make sense. A lot of people do think, actually, it's quite rude, to be perfectly honest with you. Obviously, anybody has a right and it is a democracy, but... There is a massive concern at the huge level of community pressure. So if you end up with a candidate from the Labour Party or the Conservative Party knocking on your front door, or you end up with somebody from the local mosque knocking on your front door and you and your entire family attend that mosque, there could be a huge amount of religious pressure there. And I think that could actually swing many, many seats. Uh, that, that, is, that is a huge problem. And, and frankly, look, we do want politics in this country. We do want people to be focused on issues like the National Health Service and education as well. I do not want somebody whose primary focus is the Koran to be dictating policy in this country. No. And, of course, uh, movements like that tend to appeal to the radical rather than the assimilated, and there's that issue too. Patrick Christie's, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And to take it from me, uh, I'm often asked by young conservatives, uh, even people of the left, by the way, who just want to write well, what should I read? What book? Well, the answer I always give is the same. And the odd thing is, it's actually an essay from a man who was of the left, or thought he was until he saw what the communists were doing when he was fighting the Spanish Civil War and what they were doing in Russia. And the lies of the left was telling about that. I'm talking, of course, about George Orwell, born in India, policeman in Burma, and then a journalist and writer in Britain writing classics like Animal Farm, brilliant, in 1984. But what I say is at least just read one of his essays. I have them all because I'm a huge fan. They're fantastic. You don't need to get the four books. In fact, they're hard to find. But um, one place to start with is politics and the English language. So helpful for my own writing, not just because it's got six famous rules that start... Well, here's two examples. 
Never use a long word when a short one will do. Uh, here's another. If it is possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. You've probably seen my own strip back prose. That's what I've taken to heart. But the other thing is that all also shows in this essay, because it goes far beyond that, how people use vague and windy words, complicated sentences, polysyllabic ones, flowery verbiage, and all that to hide the fact they aren't actually saying anything smart, useful, or good, or even true. Because lies tend to hide in jargon. You think of Karl Marx, gender politics. So get any collection of Gore's essays that have politics in the English language, or go to the Robinson's Bookshop website. You'll see my name there uh, and order the copy they've got there because it has got that essay and other great essays besides. So Robinson's Bookshops, go there. Whiskey of the Week, Lark from Hobart, set up by the famous Bill Lark. Very good. Uh, very, it's got spices and cinnamons and all that. The thing is, its sales fell and shares fell when their CEO, not of the Lark family, uh, was found naked with a, a crack pipe, a photo of him. It's a better whiskey than that, so try that one. Now, that's it from me. Next is Sherry Markson. She has got an explosive breakthrough. National Security Council uh, sources on Tucker Carlson. Have a look. 